Have you ever had a favorite movie or a favorite book or something and you really love it and then you find out one day that it's actually based off of a true story? Yeah, that happened to me the other day. Let's get into today's story before I spoil the movie for you. Let's go. Now, I am a fan of Alfred Hitchcock. I'm not like a stan though, so if you studied Hitchcock in film school, don't come for me. My favorite movie growing up, though, was The 39 Steps. I don't think that's a true story, though. I hope not. It's about, like, a spy and stuff. Mm. And since growing up, you know, since, you know, growing up past the age of six years old, I've definitely experienced a lot of other Hitchcock films. So, you know, things like Psycho, The Birds, which made me terrified of birds. Vertigo, Rear Window, all iconic classics. But a more personal favorite of mine from just recently over the past couple years is a film called Rope. So Rope is based off of a play uh, of the same name. And the initial reason that I was drawn to it in the first place is it's filmed in one take, it, like a play. It's like a continuous thing. So I thought that was really cool because it's not something that you can easily do. It's already hard when you're doing it in theater and then to incorporate film into it. I think that's pretty neat. The real life story of Leopold and Loeb, though, included no Hollywood actors, no lights, no cameras. However, it would become a national headline. In 1924, it was billed as the crime of the century, which it was 1924, so that's kind of a bold claim we like just started. And at the center of all, you had Nathaniel Leopold and Richard Loeb, or Dickie, as some people would call him. The public would eventually refer to them as one as Leopold and Loeb. Kind of like the first celebrity couple, I guess. Nathaniel Fr... Uh, whatever this word is. Leopold and Richard Albert Loeb, they grew up in Chicago in the neighborhood of Kenwood. Do you know who else is from Kenwood, Chicago? Obama. But we're not going to associate Obama with this trash. So we're just going to move on. Nathaniel was born November 19th, 1904. His parents were German Jewish immigrants and Nathan and Florence, his parents, were very wealthy. Leopold himself was even described as a child prodigy. Being attacked by cat hairs. It's outrageous. It's said that he spoke his first words at the age of four months old, which I, uh, is that even physically possible? Like, can your muscles do that? And he said he had an IQ of 210. I don't know if he ever actually got his IQ tested though. He was bullied in school and he did claim that his governess sexually harassed him when he was growing up. He also blamed his later actions that we're gonna talk about on that. When his family moved to Kenwood, he began to attend the private Harvard school. I'm assuming it was like a preparatory school for Harvard. And his intelligence went into overdrive. He actually graduated school at 15 years old. And he graduated with honors from the University of Chicago at 18. He would later claim that he spoke 15 languages, five of them fluently. And he was also well known for his work in, or what is it, ornithology? It's the study of birds. Now Richard Loeb, or Dickie as apparently everybody called him, but I'm not gonna call him that. He was born on June 11th, 19, uh, 1905. His father, Albert Henry Loeb, was a very wealthy attorney and he was a retired vice president of Sears and Roebuck Company. Loeb was also extremely intelligent and he did skip several grades as well. He finished high school at 15. He began his college career at the University of Chicago and then he transferred to the University of Michigan and became their youngest ever graduate at the age of 17. Weird flex, but Cool, U of M, have fun with that. Loeb was described as being obsessed with crime as people were in those days, and obviously people still are. He actually would fantasize about a life of crime. He would steal from family members. He also got in trouble for committing arson, vandalism, and actual shoplifting. He kind of liked to push the boundaries a little bit. Though he was smart, he actually really almost barely passed his classes. So he liked to get out and liked to party, which if you've ever been to a U of M campus, that's not surprising whatsoever. 
So he played a lot of sports. He also liked to drink. Uh, I think Prohibition was going on, so that was kind of a big deal. But yeah, academics, though he was really smart, they weren't his thing. He was more of the charmer type. Leopold and Loeb, you know, they grew up in the same neighborhood, but they didn't become friends until college. They got to know each other better at university. And after they graduated and Loeb came back from U of M, their bond grew even deeper. They saw each other more as intellectual equals. Where Leopold was more socially awkward, Loeb was very charming and outgoing, and he was even described as handsome, which I don't, I don't see it. Maybe it was the times. So their relationship became sexual, which I I was kind of surprised. I'd read about this case growing up, like in history books, and nowhere did they mention anything about sex. But you know, Time Life, I guess, wouldn't mention that kind of stuff anyway. So I had I had no clue. That was. That was news to me. In addition to a sexual relationship, Loeb also began including Leopold in his criminal activities and fantasies. They became more and more obsessed with the idea of creating and committing the perfect crime. You know, something that would like make headlines. I love this gold eyeshadow. Leopold being, you know, the more academic of the two, he had a particular liking to Friedrich Nietzsche, specifically the concept of Ubermensch. It means like superior human, um, ideal human, a superior man, um, or more specifically the idea that this man was above, you know, conventional society's morals, what Christian society deemed as like correct. Uh, you know who also and you know who also really liked this whole thing, this whole concept? Hitler. It's the idea for the whole Aryan superior race thing. It's kind of weird that they both were into the same ideals, but like Hitler wanted the extermination Jews, and these guys were Jewish. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure where I was going with that point. It's just really interesting how ideas move around and touch people and affect the world in so many different ways. So they eventually decided on their perfect crime. Their perfect crime was they were going to kidnap and murder a teenager. Perfect. They spent like six, seven months planning this whole thing. After lots of debating, they decided on a youth they knew named Bobby Frank. Bobby was Loeb's second cousin, so, like, his family obviously knew him. Bobby even lived across the street from Loeb, and they would play tennis together pretty regularly. So, they, like, they knew each other. How are you gonna be like, oh, yeah, the perfect murder victim is my cousin Bobby? He lives across the street. No one will ever even suspect us. On May 21st, 1924, they decided they needed to put the plane in action. Leopold, he rented a car under the name Morton D. Ballard. I mean, it was the 20s. There were lots of, like, weird names still left over from Edwardian time period, so... Isn't Morton, like, salt? That day... After they got their car, they pulled up and they offered Bobby a ride home. He actually wasn't that far from home, so at first he was like, you know what, I'm good, I don't, I don't need a ride, it's okay. But Loeb was really insistent, he wanted to talk to him about a tennis racket that he had seen him using. So Bobby was like, okay, you know, we do play tennis a lot together, he didn't think it was weird, and he got in the car. He jumped in the front seat, now... Who was in the front seat, who was in the back seat can be highly contended, but we'll go from there. So when he got in, uh, Loeb asked Bobby if he knew Leopold and, you know, he introduced the two. What happened afterwards is kind of, like, contested, but most people think that Loeb was driving and that Leopold was in the back seat with a chisel that they had bought just for this occasion. We're going in with the green concealer, folks. After that little quick exchange, they started to like drive around the block and take a longer route, which they said they'd ask Bobby and he was like, sure, and that's fine. You know, they gave him some sort of like excuse. Out of nowhere, Bobby was hit in the back of the head with the chisel by whoever 
was in the back seat. He was then dragged into the back seat and he was gagged where he soon bled out on the floorboards of the car. They then drove about 25 miles outside of Chicago to a city called Hammond, Indiana. They decided the perfect dumping spot was this little train overpass over a wolf lake. They were like, yeah, this is the spot. Let's throw it in the lake. Let's throw my cousin in the lake. They waited until nightfall and then they got Bobby out of the car. They removed all of his clothes and then they disposed of them. So to try and hide his identity, they also poured hydrochloric acid on his face and his genitals to try and hide the fact that he was circumcised. I guess it's because circumcision wasn't like very common back then. So like when police found the body, they could probably identify pretty quickly that he was Jewish. Then when they got back, they typed up a $10,000 ransom note. They did this just to throw off Bobby's family and the police. After that, they got back into town. They called Bobby's mom. Leopold identified himself as, he identified himself as George Johnson and that he kidnapped Bobby and he would be contacting her soon with more information. After that, they put that ransom note in the mailbox, they burned their clothes, and they cleaned the scene of the crime. The next day when Bobby's family got the note, they gathered all of the money quickly, which I'm like, wow, $10,000? I couldn't even quickly gather $10,000 now. In the 20s, they were rich, rich. Hello. And the family did actually start to get the whole ransom thing going. A family member was actually taking the money to the drop point to get like more information about Bobby when they realized they forgot the address and so they had to turn around. Bobby's life is, well we already know he's dead, but Bobby's life is in your hands and you forgot the effing address? Dude, hope it wasn't his dad. But in that time frame, you know, of the person, whoever that family member was, you uh, turning back home because they forgot the address, the police actually found Bobby's body. So now the family knew this was not really a ransom. This was a murder. So they actually weren't out the $10,000. They were just out Bobby. Now I get conflicting stuff about this damn typewriter. Like it just, it drove me crazy. Like I couldn't get a straight story about it. One article I read said they threw it in the lake. One article I read said they destroyed it after Bobby's body was discovered. And then another article I read said they showed it to the police. I have no idea what the true story of this stupid typewriter is. Maybe they did all three of those things. I don't know. So the police started their investigation pretty quickly. Loeb, he just, you know, was like, I'm just gonna live my life like normal. I don't want to draw any attention to myself. I'm just gonna go ahead and be my... Normal, charismatic, and charming. Ooh, gross. Leopold, however. Well, Leopold was a chatty Kathy. I just like saying that. Chatty Kathy. He spoke pretty freely with the police and with reporters. That's not a good idea, dude. He even said, if I were to murder anybody, it would be such a cocky little son of a bitch like Bobby Franks. Whoa, dude, tell us how you really feel. Also, remember that Bobby is or was only 14 years old at the time of his death. At the scene, police found a pair of glasses that had a very specific kind of hinge on it. I don't know anything about glasses, so I don't really know what the hinge was, so sorry. If you're into that kind of stuff, I can't help you there. This special kind of hinge, however, uh, only a few people in Chicago had that. Actually, only three people had that, one of them old imagine that how do you lose your glasses though like for real i wear glasses i can't just lose them leopold tried to say that oh i must have dropped them when i was bird watching there i went bird watching there literally th a week ago i must have dropped them oh my god i'm so glad you found them the hinge is so expensive yeah dude you totally went bird watching in the place where your boy toy's cousin was found murdered, like, literally the next week. Sure, I believe that. I mean, the police, they saw right through it. They ruled out all their little snotty little alibis, and they brought them in for questioning. Loeb, he cracked first. 
He pushed a narrative that it was Leopold who was in the back seat, and he was the one that hit Bobby in the back of the head. Of course, then when Leopold got in there, he said the exact opposite, that Loeb was in the back seat, and he was the one driving, and Loeb was the one that killed him. But everything else of their story was exactly the same. So in the end, it didn't really matter who was driving, who was in the back seat, because they were both just as responsible. Soon after their confessions, a trial date was set. And this was billed as the trial of the century. They were all about giving that whole, this is the thing of the century, out to like everything then. Let somebody do something in a century, you're only 20 years in. For this trial of the century, Loeb's family hired, this is for both of them, they hired Clarence Darrow. Now, little kids, if you don't know who Clarence Darrow is, let's sit down, we're gonna have a little history lesson. As if this entire thing wasn't, you know, just one big history lesson. So Clarence Darrow, if you don't remember from history class, he was the defense attorney for one of the most popular cases in education history, the state of Tennessee versus uh, Jonathan Scopes or the Scopes Monkey Trial. This trial is the trial that made it legal for evolution and, well, just any kind of real kind of science to be taught in the public school system. So Clarence Darrow, pff, Loeb's family knew what they were doing when they picked this dude. They were like, we are gonna make sure our son is safe. So Darrow knew they were not gonna be able to convince a jury that they weren't guilty, especially because they had confessed. So he also didn't wanna enter a plea of insanity because just because you enter a plea of insanity doesn't mean that you won't be found guilty and be given the death penalty. And Clarence Darrow was very against capital punishment. So he instead entered plea guilty pleas in order to get life sentences over death. So now that we've entered a guilty plea, powder all over me. Now that we've entered a guilty plea, we no longer have a trial. We have what's called a sentencing hearing instead. So the sentencing hearing lasted 32 days, which is kind of crazy because these guys have already been like, okay, yeah, we did it, our bad. But they had a lot to argue. They did not want to be getting the death penalty. They were also very young. Clarence Zero kind of used their age as like a way to be like, look at these kids. They don't know anything about life. Come on, come on, look at them. They're freaking stupid. Obviously, that is the case. They are freaking stupid. Sentencing trial, the state's attorney, they would call more eyewitnesses, and Darrow would call more character witnesses. So he would call experts in like mental health and I don't I don't know what kind of expert witnesses. People that didn't know them but like knew about the subjects at hand. And then at the conclusion of this hearing, Darrow gave what has been said to be the best speech of his entire life. It was 12 hours long. Holy, like, how do you talk for 12 hours? But I guess when people's lives are at stake, you'll do whatever it takes. He focused on their youth, of course. Their, the ideals that they learned in college. How can you blame these guys for going and getting educated and learning about Nietzsche and, you know, the ideal of superiority and stuff like that. I mean, we want people to get educations, right? I mean, yes, stay in school, kids. And then, of course, he brought up the obligatory, the American justice system is so flawed and it's inhumane. I mean, that's true. Anyway, his speech worked. The judge, the judge cited his ruling mostly due to the age of the boys and also like precedent of law that had been set before, I guess. They both received life sentences for murder and then 99 additional years for the kidnapping of Bobby Franks. They were both they were both sentenced to Joliet Prison, which is in Chicago. It's also a very haunted prison. I just watched a show about it the other day. I was like, hey. But because they were in prison together, they were able to maintain their friendship. Eventually, they were both then transferred to the Statesville Penitentiary. There, they expanded a lot with the curriculum and the education. They expanded on the high school education curriculum and junior college. 
So they were all about helping their fellow inmates get an education. I guess when you're going to be doing a maximum life sentence, you got to find something valuable and meaningful. On January 28th, 1936, Loeb was actually killed by a fellow inmate named James Day. Day sliced him 50 times with a straight razor. He had defensive wounds on his hands and arms and Loeb's throat was also slit from behind. Day would say, that rhymed, Day would say that Loeb was coming on to him and that he was just acting in self-defense. Leopold would say there's no way that would happen. I guess Leopold would know his type, right? And then later claims stated that, you know, they had found Day with other inmates before, so it wasn't surprising. He was tried for the death of Loeb, but he was acquitted. So no justice was served, but I guess justice for a murderer? I don't know. Let me put my lipstick on real quick and we will get into the rest of the story. I'm not going to do that again. Back, back, back again. Boom, boom, boom. I thought it was a new lip gloss, but I just kind of like how this looks. So I'm just going to stick with that. It's, it's been a while since I've had a matte lip and I'm into it. After Loeb's death, Leopold, you know, he, he was depressed. It was his best friend. Maybe, I thought I had another Beretta over there. <laughs> Maybe even like, you know, somebody he was in love with. The rest... There it is. The rest of his prison life was actually pretty interesting. He did continue his work in prison afterwards. He would he would continue to teach in the prison school. He organized the entire prison library. He also volunteered in the prison hospital. Do you see a theme here? It's always like a normal place, but in a prison. In 1944, he volunteered for an experimental malaria treatment where he would actually get malaria and then he became their guinea pig. So that's kind of cool. He probably saved a lot of lives doing that. In 1950, somebody, I don't know, I didn't really care enough to find out who, they wrote a book about the murders. He was pretty upset. He tried to fight it, but it was shut down. So in response, he wrote his own memoirs called Life Plus 99 Years. I don't know if you can find it, but that'd be kind of cool. After he spent 33 years in prison, he was released uh, in March of 1958. Uh, what happened to the life plus 99 years? When he got out, he tried to set up a foundation for troubled youths, but the court shot that down. They said that it, it violated his probation. Yes, it, or parole. It violated his parole, so he couldn't do that. And he actually did have a pretty hard time like reintegrating into society being that he was not only a felon, but kind of a well-known felon. He, he wanted to be famous or, you know, a famous criminal. I guess he got his wish. Eventually, he got some luck. The, what is it? Brethren, it feels very unnatural to say, but the Brethren Service Commission, which is like a missionary offshoot of the Brethren Christian community. Brethren... It's just a weird word, brethren. They accepted him into their missions program and he was very thankful. They got him set up as a, a medic tech, a laboratory tech, and they sent him to Puerto Rico where he worked in the x-ray labs. He eventually set up permanent residence in Puerto Rico. He got married to a widowed librarian. The idea of him being with a librarian is kind of like a perfect match. You know, I wonder if she knew who he was or like if he told her what he did. Now, he would go by Nate, not Nathan or Nathaniel or whatever the hell his name was, and definitely not Leopold. He didn't want people to know. So eventually, he married this woman. He also went and earned his master's at the University of Puerto Rico. He became a professor at the university. He also did a lot of research on leprosy. He worked with Puerto Rico on urban renewal, like overall like Department of Health there. So he did a lot. After he got out of prison, he contributed a lot to society, especially to an area that needed help and still needs help. So it's kind of admirable. He also continued his study of birds while he was in Puerto Rico, and he would travel the entirety of Puerto Rico watching and studying all their birds. He even wrote a book about the birds of Puerto Rico called the, what was it? the Checklist of Birds of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. I have never been to either place, but I'm assuming they probably have beautiful tropical birds. Then on August 29th, that's actually my birthday. Is this we're talking about August 29th, 1971. So on August 29th, 1971, 
Leopold actually died of a heart attack that was caused by his diabetes. And in death, he donated his corneas, his eye, part of his eye, to science. Maybe for donation for somebody or for study. It's kind of wild the direction that his life took after going to prison. I mean, obviously he was a kid and people do change. He took one life, but with contributing to malaria research and leprosy and setting up educational systems in prisons, he changed and probably saved a lot of lives. It's it's kind of crazy. I'm I'm assuming he was probably very remorseful of what he did and was really thankful to have gotten a second chance to come back out into society and at least try to atone for his mistakes. And, you know, I'm obviously not a judge or a jury. I've never been on jury duty or anything. I'm kind of... Most people are like, oh, jury duty. And I'm like, why don't I get to go? But he was probably very thankful that he got a second chance. And I feel like this shows that he has definitely atoned and, and learned from his horrible mistake. So, I did mention that Rope is one of my favorite movies, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the plot of it. It's, it's weird because I was reading about Leopold and Loeb, and I was like, this sounds like Rope. So then I looked up Rope, totally inspired by this. Rope was, well, it was based off of a play, and the play was based off of a book, and the book was based off of the entire story I just told you. So, Rope, in essence, is based off of the entire story that I just told you. Specifically, it's about two friends who in the very beginning, they are murdering a third friend. So they kind of allude to the fact that in college it was like these three and this other guy. So it was the four of them were like intellectually superior than everyone else that they ever came across like in the world. Sound familiar? In the beginning, they're killing their friend because they want to commit the perfect crime. So they kill him with a rope, hence the name, and then they put him into like a trunk and they turn it into a banquet table, a buffet table, if you will, and they have an entire party where they invite a bunch of guests and all the guests are asking, well, where is he? Where is he at? And they're like, well, I don't know. JK, he's underneath the napkins. Then their fourth intellectually superior friend arrives and he is played by James Stewart or Jimmy Stewart, whatever you want to call him, from It's a Wonderful Life. Love Jimmy Stewart. So he, they are trying to... I think they're trying to like impress him with their amazing intellect and wit because they think they're going to be able to pull a fast one on him thereby making them intellectually superior to him. And for some reason they thought that like their other friend was just gonna be cool with the fact that they killed their friend. I don't know. But the movie's really cool, it's really good. Like I said, it was filmed all in one take. So you have to think, when people are filming movies, they usually just focus on the scenes that they're gonna be working on the next day or like within that week. So for this, you had to learn the entire script because you were going to be performing it at once. Not unlike what people do when they are doing theater productions. So you also have to learn blocking, which if you don't know theater and you don't know blocking, that's you knowing where you're going to walk to and where things are and where another person's going to be. And also like learning all of the cues. You don't just have to learn your cue, you have to learn everybody's cue so you know that you're at the right place, the right time, because you don't get to go back and redo this. That's how they filmed this movie. On top of making sure all the actors and everything had their blocking down, you also have to have the camera guy have his blocking down and the sound guy too and it has to be a completely quiet set. You can't give people directions at all. So they had to go through months and months of rehearsals and practice to make sure that they got all of this right, including the tech crew. It's just, I think it's really cool and it's an amazing feat. It's not the only film that he did like that, but it's actually the only one that I've seen and the one I'm most familiar with. And I, I really do like it. I really recommend it. 10 out of 10, great Hitchcock film. Once again though, if you studied Hitchcock in film school and you're like a connoisseur, don't come at me, don't try me. I didn't, I didn't go to film school. I'm just telling you what I appreciate and what I enjoy. So with that being said, that brings us to the end of today's video. If you liked the video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget, I am running a giveaway until December 20th of this year, which is 2020. So you can get your own brand new unopened 
palette of the Norvina Anastasia, Beverly Hills, Volume 3. Uh, this is, I did use some of this today for the reds. It's a beautiful palette. This is actually supposed to be white, but I kind of like went in hard with a red, so. So if you do want to be entered to win this, I will link the video on how to do that here, and I will link it down below as well. So may the odds be ever in your favor for this bad boy. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time when we sit down and talk about another true crime and I put a ridiculous amount of makeup on for nowhere to go. See you guys next time. Bye.